we now move on to the next segment clinical pearls for internist immunodeficiency so i am pleased to welcome the chairpersons dr bandusi ratnayaka and dr pivaruthan on stage over to you sir good afternoon ladies and gentlemen next segment is a type of lecture it's a clinical pearls for internist the speaker is a professor avni joshi uh, professor joshi uh is a professor of pediatric and medicine and is the chair of the pediatric allergy and immunology and is the associated program director for the allergy and immunology fellowship program at mayo clinic rochester minnesota usa uh, professor jose is going to talk about immunodeficiency uh over to you professor jose good morning thank you so much for the kind invitation and the introduction um and I'm, i'm a pediatrician by training but i'm so excited to talk about something which is very dear and near to my heart in my practice of immune deficiency i see um 50% kids and adults and something that i missed out during my training so i hope uh, the next 20 minutes or so uh would be helpful as you navigate your practice um let me just see how this works okay so um and i just to be sure the mouse and Sir Mouse. Okay, perfect. So here are my learning objectives. I want to understand uh, the different manifestations of immune deficiency disorders. I want us to decipher when should we suspect an immune deficiency and which are the basic tests that you could order as a busy internist. And when do you phone a friend or call for help if you have a patient that you suspect an immune deficiency because these are rare diseases. So What is an immune deficiency? Immune deficiency disorders are a diverse group of disorders and they affect different aspects of the immune system. So we'll have a few slides kind of taking you back to med school. These patients have increased risk of infections. A small cold can hospitalize them, so they are at higher risk for infection, higher risk for more severe infections. Not only that, they also have autoimmune diseases like immune thrombocytopenia autoimmune hemolytic anemia and they also have a risk of cancer so many times you will see somebody just with a bad autoimmune disease or just with a bad cancer driven by ebv these also may fall into immune deficiency disorder so in the past we used to think infection is the hallmark but over time we have recognized not only infection but autoimmune diseases also is a part and parcel of this disorder So what is a primary immunodeficiency? Primary is something inherent, right? This is something you inherit from your parents. It's a genetic issue where you have a defect with your immune system. Um something that you recognize as a secondary immune deficiency is not something you inherited. It is either an effect of an extrinsic factor, so not related to yourself like an infection. HIV is the most common that we encounter or long term steroid use or more commonly as we see in cancers with the use of immunomodulatory medication malnutrition is another big one and we'll talk about it in the end so just to have the landscape right most primary immunodeficiency disorder it's inherited secondary it's likely an extrinsic factor so primary are rare so something that accounts for less then 10% of the immune deficiency disorders either you're missing an enzyme you're missing a cell type there is a defect in the pathway for immune activation and these are congenital disorders usually will manifest early in life as time has gone we have found some hypomorphic mutation in elderly patients but the usual paradigm is you'll find a young child with a bad infection the secondary immune deficiency which are much more common and i would like for you to remember that um are usually manifesting it with as i mentioned earlier uh, at any age either early or late so with that in mind i want to just have a little bit of disclaimers as we talk the focus of this talk is going to be on primary immune deficiency that's what is my bread and butter practice every day but we'll also talk about the more common phenomena of the secondary immune deficiencies always remember to rule out hiv if you ever have a patient i have made the mistake sometimes and i have paid the price so something that has been ingrained in me that i despite not having any risk factors always rule out hiv always look for nutritional deficiencies always assess for concurrent steroid usage 
And remember, there are these mimickers of immune deficiency, the most common being cystic fibrosis and primary ciliary dyskinesia. So with that background in mind, um, I just want to have a brief outline. We'll talk about the epidemiology of the immune deficiency disorders. We'll talk about the overview of the immune system. We'll talk about two cases, and these are clinical pearls I want you to take home. We'll discuss a severe and a less severe form of immune deficiency. And finally, what a busy internal medicine physician needs to know about immune deficiency, especially in context of vaccination. So here's a graph which shows the prevalence of primary immunodeficiency disorders across the globe. Um, as you see in the red where the prevalence is higher and the lighter shades are much lower. If you see here in Sri Lanka, we don't have much of reporting system yet built for immune deficiencies. Partly there's less awareness, less resources, but this on the bottom shows the US immune deficiency prevalence rate. It's about five to 10 per 100,000. And the US TB rate is about 2.7 per 100,000. You know, these are prevalence numbers may not be as accurate as incidence numbers, but just trying to stress that these, this is not a trivial problem, something that we have under-recognized and have had delayed in recognition uh, over time. So when should you consider somebody to have an immune deficiency? If they have a severe infection, if they have a complicated infection, they come in with uh, empyema that is poorly, um, does not respond well to antibiotics, has needed multiple chest tubes. The infection is in multiple locations, so they could have disseminated tuberculosis, a talk that we're gonna have after me, or the presentation is unusual or the infection is difficult to treat. So oral antibiotics do not work. The patient needs multiple rounds of parental antibiotics. That's when you start thinking, or the infection is persistent. And let's say they had an episode of pneumonia, but they are left with bronchiectasis. All of these should be red flags that you should think, okay, this patient seems to have something wrong with the immune system. What do I do now? And the final thing is, if it is present in multiple family members, that's again a red flag for an inherited genetic issue that you should think about an immune deficiency disorder. So this is a slide of 10 warning signs in a child who could have an immune deficiency disorder if they have multiple ear infections, if they've had need for IV antibiotics with hospitalization, they've had sepsis episodes. But in the interest of our audience here, not only the Immune Deficiency Foundation came up with 10 warning signs in children, but there are these 10 warning signs in adults that I want us to focus on, where you've had multiple infections per year, you've had need for longer antibiotics, you've had chronic diarrhea with weight loss, so that's another sign that you could have an immune deficiency disorders. You've had recurrent viral infections like warts, herpes, warts in different areas, disseminated warts, that's another sign for an immune deficiency disorders. Um, you've had more deep-seated infections like abscesses, disseminated infections, and the final thing with a family member who also has a similar manifestation. So as a pediatrician, I always ask for family history, but as an internist, sometimes we miss out. If you see somebody like that, always ask, is there another family member who could have a similar manifestation which can tell us likely this is an inherited genetic disorder. So let's say you think about a, a problem. Um, in the past, when I was in training, we had to go uh, suspect somebody to have an immune deficiency, go back to pick up your Harrison's textbook of internal medicine, go to chapter 351, what is the diagnosis, what are the tests you order for a specific disease. Now with our times, you could click what are the tests for immune deficiency and Google will give you the answers within seconds. So the problem now is not access to the information, but whether you're thinking about it. And so my hope is at the end of this talk, you will think about the immune deficiency more so on some of these patients that come to your practice. So I really want to stress that we see the world not as it is, but we see the world where we are. And I hope we transition to the, uh, the place where we'll start thinking about immune deficiencies in some of our patients. So a little background on how the immune system works. We have three layers of defense against infection. The outermost is our anatomical and physical barriers. If you think of your saliva, your tears, the ciliary clearance we heard about, all of those help prevent certain infections, the gastric pH being one. The second tier is our innate immune system, 
It's static. It does not improve over time. This is what we are born with. And adaptive, the innermost, grows with us as we grow old. And the major players here are the T and B lymphocytes. So these are the different lymphoid organs in our body. And the innate and adaptive immune system are not in isolation. They have significant crosstalk with each other and help with the immune functioning. So just as a quick reminder, the innate immune system kicks in first within minutes to hours of an infection. The adaptive takes longer, but it has a recall memory. And part of the reason we have the immunizations is to really build the adaptive immune system to have the recall immune response. So um, this is a slide just kind of framing the talk here. Uh, the innate immune system consists of the phagocytes, the natural killer cells, the epithelial barriers, which kicks in on the x-axis within minutes to hours of the infection. The adaptive takes longer, and the B lymphocytes are the ones which generate antibodies. And the antibodies help prevent sinopulmonary infections, pneumonia, bronchitis, and these are the usual manifestations for patients who have a B cell defect. And if you have a T cell defect, the patients behave like somebody who has HIV. And the common manifestation is oropharyngeal thrush or significant systemic candle infections. So what do we do? How do we test for a primary immunodeficiency disorder? As I mentioned, and kind of stressing again, stressing rule out secondary causes first. And then we have three tiers of testing. And I want us to focus just on tier one, where we should offer it to most patients. And tier two and three, we should leave it when we really, really think this patient could have an immune deficiency disorder. So tier one, we offer to all patients that come to us, tier two to a select few, and tier three is for the very select patient that I'll come and talk about in the end. So the first tier of testing for anyone for an immune deficiency is the simple test of CBC with differential. Now I'm stressing here with the differential because many times we ignore the, the lymphocyte count in the differential. So many times we will look at the ANC, the absolute neutrophil count, and if that is fine, we overlook the lymphocyte count. This is a very cheap, easy test available for most patients to look at a CBC with differential to ensure the lymphocyte count is fine. And then as we assess, I want us to look at the immune system from a quantitative fashion and a qualitative. Quantitative meaning, are there adequate numbers of the immune cells? And quality meaning, even if the numbers are present, are they functioning? And with that in mind, if you're thinking of the humoral immune system, meaning somebody who could have bad pneumonia, bronchitis, empyema, you should just get their baseline immunoglobulins, IgG, IgM, and IgA. These are three basic tests to remember if you see a patient with bad pneumonia. If you want a qualitative assessment, these are more looking at vaccine responses to different childhood vaccinations and adult vaccinations as we'll talk about. Basic tests to remember if you have somebody with ba bad sinopulmonary infection. If a patient could have more of a T cell defect, somebody who behaves like HIV, but HIV is negative, you can check for the T and B lymphocyte quantitation to see if they have significant T cell lymphopenia. If you're thinking from a functional perspective for the T cell, you can do T cell functional studies. And I would not elaborate on these because these become very specialized tests where you really need to have somebody help you in the process, kind of phone a friend or email a friend. As I mentioned, the tier two testing are more specific assessment immunophenotyping wise, and the tier three assessment are more genetic testing where we do whole exome and whole genome sequencing. And many times we do multiple family members, the proband and their parents, like a trio testing to look at genetic etiologies for some of these immune deficiencies. So majority of the immune deficiencies are humoral. So these are antibody deficiencies, more than 70% that we see. But there is a smattering of other forms of immune deficiencies, which include cellular phagocytic defects like chronic granulomatous disease, which we see very commonly in Southeast Asia. So this is an older study that we did um, in Rochester at Mayo Clinic using the record linkage system saying, how common are these? And at what age groups do we see these patients manifest? And what we found were these two different peaks. There was these teenagers and then there was these young adults that did not get to notice for many decades. They would keep coming in with pneumonias, but nobody was checking their immune system. 
And so there was a significant delay in diagnosis causing worse outcome in these patients. And as time has gone on, we have more awareness. And so we see more higher incidence of some of these immune deficiency disorders over time. These patients do poorly. So if you look at the survival curve of somebody who does not have an immune deficiency as compared to somebody who does, the risk of mortality is much higher. And if you have complications with some of these immune deficiencies, you do much poorly. So somebody who has recurrent infections with autoimmune manifestations seem to do extremely poorly as somebody who does not. So what are these autoimmune manifestations? As I initially mentioned, um, these patients are at 120 times, I want to stress that 120 times higher risk of autoimmune cytopenias, autoimmune thyroid disorders, celiac disease, autoimmune entropathy, something that many times may not ring a bell in your head about an immune deficiency, but very commonly seen in these patients. So switching gears, I want to give you a few pearls. I want to talk about a young infant. I know this is an internal medicine audience, but just to stress a few points. So this was a two-month-old Somali male child that came to us. Um, he presented with fever, irritability, and rash. And so there was a suspicion for meningitis for a young two-month-old infant. The patient underwent a full sepsis workup, blood cultures, broad-spectrum antibiotics, everything was initiated. As a pediatrician, you always go back to the past. So even though the baby was only two months old, we went back and asked, okay, what happened to the child at birth? The child did have petechiae. So everyone was worried about thrombocytopenia. They looked at the platelet count, which was fine. The baby was sent home. We looked at the CBC at that point in time. The white cell count was 4,000, but the absolute lymphocyte count was zero. So that should have raised red flags that the baby should not have been discharged home. But because there was less of awareness to look for the lymphocyte count or assess it, the baby was just sent home. And the family history was very significant. Parents were first degree cousins, and there was a two-year-old sibling who had a sensory neural hearing loss. All of these were red flags in retrospect. And the baby was not thriving. At two months, the growth percentile, both weight and height, were below the fifth percentile. And so this was important that the baby could have had an autosomal recessive disease. And this is how the baby presented to us, pretty significant rash. And we had a chest x ray done and the child had pneumocystis pneumonia. So was behaving somebody like who could have HIV with an absolute lymphocyte count of 100 when the child presented. So we were kind of debating what kind of immune deficiency the baby could have. In the interest of time, I'll give you the answer. This is a form of a very severe immune deficiency called SCID, severe combined immunodeficiency. Uh, this baby was uh, diagnosed with SCID. He had no T cells, no B cells, no NK cells. The adenosine deaminase enzyme was zero. We started him on it, but the baby did very poorly. He had RSV pneumonia, was intubated, had chronic lung disease, um, and it was not improving, we withdrew support, and the baby passed away. So these patients really have left a question in always my mind saying, how could we have saved this baby? So if you've not seen the movie, The Bubble Boy, kind of talks a similar story of a patient with immune deficiency that could you keep these babies in a bubble and prevent a, a, just a viral infection from taking them to the hospital and them dying? And with that in mind, early diagnosis is is important. We have newborn screen in US in all the states for severe combined immunodeficiency that we diagnose them early, transplant them early, and this has been a life-saving measure. So kind of coming back to our slide, we talked about the lower bottom part of a T-cell defect first, and now we'll talk about more of the humoral or something that you will see commonly in your practice uh, with patients presenting with pneumonia, bronchitis, recurrent sinus infections. And the two most common syndromes that you will see are CVID, common variable immunodeficiency, and or, or selective IgA deficiency. So this is a case of a 21-year-old male. He's had a history of cough on and off. You've learned from Dr. Iyer, you've ruled out bad causes of cough, and the top three may be a possibility. But along with that, this young man also has a recurrent respiratory tract infection history since age five. He has another hit, he has ITP, and it has improved over time, and he's complaining that he's having some abdominal distension. So 
Um, you're a very astute physician. You're concerned. The chest X-ray do does show some infiltrates. You get a CT. There is some mild bronchiectasis. So there are multiple red flags here. You're starting to think, could this be an immune deficiency? So you now order some basic immune studies. You order a CBC. You look at the differential. The lymphocyte count is fine. So that's good. But his immunoglobulins are very low. IgG is 200. IgA is absent. IgM is at 5. And his lymphocyte count is fine. So you make the diagnosis of CVID for him, common variable immunodeficiency, where you have a marked decrease in your immunoglobulins, the immune deficiency is after age two, and you have poor response to vaccination. And you've ruled out other causes. That's the most common thing that you see. These patients are treated with immunoglobulin. It's a supplemental product. You can do it IV or sub-Q. But then two years later, he comes back with worsening respiratory symptoms. So this is how his CT scan looks like, significant infiltrates bilaterally um, with interstitial changes. And this is how his abdomen looks like, significant hepatosplenomegaly and lymphadenopathy throughout. He, uh, at this point in time, you start thinking, what should I do? Should I do a lymph node biopsy? Could he have lymphoma? Should I phone a friend? Should I think of doing a lung biopsy? Or should I do all of the above? And likely all of the above could be a good reason, but um, the patient underwent splenectomy, and this is the size of his spleen, and the patient had splenic lymphoma. So not only did he start with an autoimmune disease with an immune deficiency, and over time, he has developed a form of cancer. These patients also developed ca non-case-eating granulomas. Many of them look like sarcoids, so the manifestations can be very varied. Not only infections that we see in this picture here, but many autoimmune diseases that we mentioned, they may look like somebody who has celiac disease, but it is a manifestation of autoimmune enteropathy, infectious issues, malignancy, and autoimmunity. So we talked about primary immunodeficiency, and I want to focus a little bit on the secondary immunodeficiencies that you will encounter more commonly with the growing use of immunomodulation. Rituximab being the biggest culprit that we see in our practice. Half of my patients now are post-rituximab hypogammaglobinemia in the clinic because rituximab is used for not only lymphoma, but also for many other autoimmune diseases. And post-rituximab hypogammaglobinemia looks and behaves pretty much like the CVID patient we talked about with recurrent infections. Um, there is a bigger epidemic of obesity around us, and we see significant immune dysfunction in these patients with obesity and how lifestyle factors affects immune functioning. And then there is the bigger role of micronutrients, vitamin D being the major role, especially in North America and vitamin D deficiencies, where vitamin D has an important role in regulatory T cell function. During COVID, we did a study with one of a few of my endocrine colleagues looking at what does vitamin D have a role in COVID-19 and is there an association? And we found that there was a significant association, the odds were nearly two and a half times having significantly bad outcomes with mortality with COVID as compared to somebody who was not vitamin D deficient. These are all not correlation studies. These are kind of systematic reviews. Is vitamin D a culprit versus just an association likely a factor? But something to think about in your practice as you assess for micronutrient deficiencies in your patients. Finally, what else could you do if you suspect immune deficiency? If you have a patient who comes in with recurrent pneumonias, always do think about vaccination. And in the pre-workshop yesterday, we had a long discussion about different vaccinations in, in our patients, but not to belabor the point, do think of pneumonia vaccinations in patients who present with recurrent infections. And so I looked at the Indian Chess Society guidelines as well as multiple CDC guidelines that really considering pneumovax and Prevnar if it's available for patients presenting with a question of immune deficiencies. While you're still working them up, doing the Prevnar or pneumovax is gonna be both diagnostic as well as potentially therapeutic. Diagnostic meaning if they do not mount an immune response, you have an immune deficiency. Therapeutic meaning if they do mount an immune response, it's likely gonna prevent recurrent other episodes of pneumonia for them in the future. So I wanted to stress to see 
Let's start thinking about immune deficiencies. Let's have that at the back of our mind. If somebody presents unusually, you have a question, this does not sound like the run of the mill case. I'm stressing, when do you consider immune deficiency? When you have somebody who is severe, complicated, infection is in multiple location, the presentation is unusual, these are difficult to treat, or the infection is persistent, or there are residual changes. And finally, if there's a family member who is also having recurrent infections, really unusual presentation, autoimmunity, what's difficult to control, difficult to control what's in systemic areas. Um, so this is a take home slide. I want you to take a picture if you would like. If you're thinking about immune deficiency, this is the basic immune workup that you should think about. Just guess it, getting baseline immunoglobulins, this is a cheap, easy test available at most hospitals. Some of these more specialized tests like lymphocyte enumeration may or may not be available, and that's okay. You can just start with basic immunoglobulins as a first-year screening test for your patients. And that's all I have. Um, thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Yoshi, for an interesting and informative lecture. Uh, we can allow one or two questions. Yes, that's a very good point, Dr. Semha. So the question was, is it okay to get these tests during acute infection? Ideally not. Uh, you would like to do this once the infection is resolved, but many times we do not have the luxury of time. So many times I have missed out on saying, could we have this patient return for follow-up and do the test? And the patient never returns to follow up or never makes it back, we don't know. So what I tend to do is, I tend to get these labs when they're sick and potentially kind of have that understanding that, oh, the steroids were also given along with antibiotics. Could the steroids have caused the immunoglobulins to be low? or this was critical illness, there is consumption of many antibodies, and sometimes there is increase in IgG levels during an infection. So I do take that into account, and then we'll also test them again when they have uh, healed from the infection. Very good point, yeah. Yes, Dr. Shah. So we have some concepts in endocrinology about what the effect of hyperglycemia, high blood glucose, uncontrolled diabetes, and infections. Do you consider that as sort of uh, cause of recurrent infections? If so, bacterial, vir viral versus, bacterial, fungal versus viral, et cetera, and yeah, yeah. uncontrolled very diabetes. Very good point. And I think that's why diabetes is considered a high risk condition for vaccinations. If you look at pneumococcal vaccination, diabetes is considered a risk factor. I think especially for candidal infection, there's a much higher risk. So there is more T cell defect with uncontrolled hyperglycemia in patients. So as you see, I think vaginal candidiasis is, is a common manifestation in patients with diabetes. So we see more of the T cell issue, but the encapsulated organisms are also um, many times seen with diabetes. And we see more so in patients with type one diabetes, which is more like an autoimmune disorder. So we see more splenic dysfunction with type one diabetes uh, where hemophilus influenzae um, and meningococcal infection we've seen more commonly there. Thank you very much. So we will conclude this session. May I invite Dr. Bandusri Ratnayakar to hand over the certificate to Professor Joshi.